A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today is 17th of March 2022. Before getting into our discussion, we have a small announcement for you. We are happy to inform you that we are starting the next pre-fit batch. This batch is called as pre-fit rapid batch. The entrance test will be conducted on 20th March 2022. The entrance exam can be attempted in both online and offline mode. The entrance exam time will be from 2:30 p.m. to 4:30 p.m. at all Shankar IAS Academy centers and online. The program starts on 28th of March 2022. And in order to facilitate students, there are morning and evening batches in both online and offline formats. And the course duration is from 28th of March 2022 to 29th of May 2022. You will be having a total number of 45 tests. This includes three mock tests as well. The course fees for pre-fit general is rupees two thousand four hundred ninety-nine, and the course fees for pre-fit with scholarship based on performance in entrance exam is rupees thousand two hundred and fifty. And for more information and registration, please use the link given in the description. Now coming back to the news article discussion, these are the list of topics we are going to discuss today. So without wasting much time, let's get into the discussion. Look at this editorial article. This editorial talks about the circular economy. See, cleaner technologies such as solar energy and batteries plays an important role in India's future economic growth. So the finance minister emphasized on it in the budget speech. Also, she mentioned the importance of transitioning to a circular economy from the existing linear one. So in this context let us discuss about what is a circular economy then we will see the benefits of it finally we will see the steps suggested by the author to nurture the circular economy okay before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it so firstly what is a circular economy see basically a circular economy is an industrial system It is an alternative to the highly extractive and resource intensive linear economy. See, the linear economy revolves around the principle of take, make and dispose. Whereas the circular economy replaces the end of life concept with restoration and regeneration. So for this purpose, the circular economy shift towards usage of superior design of materials, products, systems and business models. Because this shift will be useful for waste elimination. And this circular economy aims at retaining the highest value of resources, products and materials. Now how will the circular economy retains the highest value? Firstly, it is done by keeping them in use as long as possible and secondly by minimizing the wastages at each life cycle stages and thirdly the highest value is retained by extracting the maximum value that is it is done through reusing repairing recovering remanufacturing and regenerating the products and materials at the end of each service value so far we have seen what is a circular economy now let's see few environmental benefits and social benefits of adopting this circular economy now first take the environmental benefits the first benefit is the reduction in the volume of the waste generated see the long lasting products or materials will lead to reduction in the volume of the waste generated okay now the second benefit is that the circular economy will help in the reduction in the extraction pressure that is it helps in the reduction of extraction pressure on rare earth elements that are predominantly found in biodiversity rich areas see the enhanced resource recovery from the e waste helps in reducing the extraction pressure also it helps in landscape restoration and regeneration of degraded mined areas lastly the responsible and circular resource use can contribute towards reduction of greenhouse gas emissions thus it helps to meet the climate change commitments now take the social benefits firstly it will help to reduce conflict and displacement in mining areas secondly it helps in improving health and welfare of local communities in the mining areas 
Thirdly, it provides for more job opportunities and helps in poverty reduction. So we can conclude that the circular economy is very significant. This is because an efficient waste management ecosystem would be necessary to manage the enormous waste generated by renewable energy projects in the coming decade. So far we have seen about the circular economy and the environmental and social benefits. Now let's see the steps suggested by the author to nurture this circular economy. Now the first step is to be taken by the policy makers. See they have to revise the existing electronic waste management rules. We know that these rules are based on extended producer responsibility. Now what is this extended producer responsibility? See it is a policy approach under which the producers are given a significant responsibility which is both financial and physical responsibility. And this is for the treatment or disposal of post consumer products. Assigning such responsibility could provide incentives to prevent wastes at the source and it will promote product design for the environment. And also it can support the achievement of public recycling and materials management goals. So revising the regulations by clearly defining the responsibilities of various stakeholders and providing annual targets for the collection and recycling of the waste is highly essential. Now coming to the second step. The second step is to ban dumping and burning of different components. See, we know that the landfilling is the cheapest and most common practice to manage renewable energy waste. However, it is not environmentally sustainable. This is because the metals and non-metals with different level of toxicity are used in clean energy technologies. And when these are dumped in the open lands, they could leach into the environment and can enter the food chain. And when we burn these components, it may release toxic gases into the environment. And thirdly, there should be enough investment in the research and development of recycling technologies. See, this is an image showing the aluminium recycling. You can clearly see that the steps involves both manual and automated process. Here, investing in research and development could help discover new ways of recycling. This result in higher efficiency and less environmentally damaging footprint. See, in this image itself, you can see how the recycled aluminium material gets back into the economy as a useful product, right? Now, coming to the fourth suggestion. There has to be a creation of innovative financing routes for waste management. For example, the public and private sector bank should be given a push by the central government. This push is to make these banks charge lower interest rates on loans that are dispersed for setting up of renewable energy waste recycling facilities. Then issuing performance based green certificates to the recyclers that could be traded to raise money for waste management would also help ease the financial burden. Also a market for recycled materials could be created. And here there should be a mandatory procurement by the renewable energy and other relevant manufacturing industries. Now the fifth suggestion is that there needs to be an improvement in product design and quality. See we have already discussed that certain components used in the production of clean energy are toxic. Hence the manufacturers should find substitute for these toxic metals such as cadmium and lead that they use in making the products. And finally, there should be a stringent quality control standard for components used in the tenders. Because this will prevent premature end of life of components. Hence, it reduces the waste creation. So, the renewable energy recycling ecosystem is helpful for achieving sustainable future. Also, it would offer quality employment opportunities for the future generations. And not only this, the efficient renewable energy waste management and circular ecosystem is helpful for the informal sector workers. This is because the majority of the workers in the renewable energy waste management is the informal sector workers. And that's all about this editorial. Now we will do a quick recap. In this discussion, we have seen what is a circular economy. It is an industrial system which replaces the end of life concept with restoration and regeneration. 
and this is done through reusing uh, repairing recovering remanufacturing and regenerating the products and materials at the end of each service value then we have seen some environmental and social benefits and then finally we have seen six steps suggested by the author of this editorial to nurture this circular economy what are these six steps we will quickly revise now the first step is to revise the existing electronic waste management rules and the second step is to ban dumping and burning of different components and thirdly there should be enough investment in the research and development of recycling technologies and coming to the fourth step we have to create the innovative financing route for waste management now coming to the fifth suggestion there needs to be an improvement in product design and quality and finally there should be a stringent quality control standards for the components used in the tenders with this learning we will move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this news article is about the coastal regulation zone that is crz it mentions that kerala government has proposed to change the categories of 175 panchayat from coastal regulation zone 3 category to coastal regulation zone 2 category so in this discussion let us see what is cr is it and also the 2019 amendments to understand the article before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it See, India has a coastline of 7,516 kilometers, which are rich in biodiversity and supports the livelihood of fishermen. So, conservation and protection of the coastal environment becomes an important task. And for this purpose, in 1991, the Union Ministry of Environment notified the Coastal Regulation Zone notification. So what the notification does is it declares certain coastal stretches as coastal regulation zone under section 3 of Environment Protection Act of 1986. Here note that the coastal regulation zone area is based on the high tide line. Now what is this high tide line? See, high tide line means the line on the land up to which the highest water line reaches during the spring tide. and this high tide line is demarcated by the national center for sustainable coastal management see the red line here is the high tide line and the line next to it is the low tide line or ltl now the land area between this high tide line and low tide line is called the intertidal zone so this is the crz area basically it includes the land area between the high tide line to 500 meters on the landward side along the sea front then also it includes the land area between the high tide line to 50 meters or width of the creek water bodies etc whichever is less further it includes the water and the bed area between the low tide line to the territorial water limit which is 12 nautical miles See the main objective of the notification is to protect the coastal environment and marine areas and to regulate development activities along the coastal areas. So overall the notification will ensure livelihood security to fishing communities and other local communities living in the coastal areas and it will conserve and protect the coastal stretches. Further it will promote sustainable development in the coastal areas based on the scientific principles considering the dangers of natural hazards and sea level rise due to global warming see it will also impose restriction on industries operation and processes in the coastal regulation zone area here note that the 1991 notification was revised in 2011 and amended from time to time The recent amendment was made by the 2019 notification based on the recommendation of Dr. Silesh Nayak Committee Report of 2015. Now here comes the important points. Now to regulate the notification classifies the coastal areas into four zones. What are these four zones? See, the first zone is the coastal regulation zone 1. and these coastal regulation zone ones are areas which are environmentally most critical this crz1 is further classified into crz1a and crz1b now what is the difference see crz1a includes the ecologically sensitive areas such as mangroves coral reefs etc 
so generally no activities are permitted here except certain eco tourism activities and construction of roads then the crz1b it is the intertidal zone here some activities are permitted even land reclamation is permitted for foreshore facilities like ports now the second zone it is the coastal regulation zone 2 it is the build up area and includes the developed land areas close to the shoreline see here they have a specified build up ratio and have drainage and approach roads and other infrastructural facilities such as water supply sewerage mains etc in coastal regulation zone 2 construction activities are permitted but with certain conditions now the third zone it is the coastal regulation zone 3 see the crz3 zones are relatively undisturbed areas that is the rural areas it is further classified into crz 3a and 3b this classification is based on population density but the important point to be noted here in crz3 is that it also earmarks the no development zone what is this no development zone see in this zone only certain activities are permissible and others are regulated for example, construction in general in CRZ3 is not at all permitted. So the development of vacant plots for construction of beach resorts or beach hotels is permitted only beyond this no development zone. See on the other hand, agriculture and horticulture are permitted but they are regulated. The difference between CRZ3A and CRZ3B is that area up to 50 meters from the high tide line on the landward side is no development zone in CRZ3A whereas the same is 200 meters for CRZ3B. I will repeat again that is the no development zone is the area up to 50 meters from the high tide line in CRZ3A whereas it is 200 meters for CRZ3B. Okay. But here note that CRZ3 includes those rural areas which do not fall under CRZ2. So when a rural area satisfies the CRZ2 criteria of having a specified built up area and infrastructural facilities, a CRZ3 area could be designated as CRZ2. And this is what proposed to be done by the Kerala government in case of 175 panchayats. Now finally the fourth zone that is the coastal regulation zone 4. See it is the water area and further it is classified into CRZ 4A and 4B. Here many activities are allowed such as traditional fishing by local communities etc. So these are some of the basics you have to know about CRZ regulations. Now we will do a quick recap. The CRZ area is based on the high tide line. And we saw that the high tide line means the line on the land up to which the highest water line reaches during a spring tide. And we have also seen about intertidal zone. It is a land area between high tide line and low tide line. Then we have seen an important notification that is CRZ notification 2019. It classifies coastal areas into four zones. The first zone is CRZ1. These are environmentally most critical zones. This zone is further classified into CRZ 1A and 1B and 1A includes the ecologically sensitive areas such as mangroves and coral reefs. Here no activities are permitted except certain tourism activities and construction of roads. And in CRZ 1B certain activities are permitted like land reclamation. And the coastal regulation zone 2 is the build up area and it includes the developed land areas close to the shoreline. In CRZ2, construction activities are permitted with conditions. And then coming to the third zone, which is CRZ3, which are relatively undisturbed areas. Here only we have no development zone. In no development zone, only certain activities are permissible and others are regulated. And then finally, the fourth zone is the coastal regulation zone 4. It is a water area and many activities are allowed, such as traditional fishing by local communities. And that's all regarding this news article. Now we will move on to next news article discussion. Look at this lead editorial article. This editorial talks about the recent Karnataka High Court judgment on the Resham vs. State of Karnataka case. According to the author of this editorial, the hijab judgment was against the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity and the principles that are enshrined in the preamble of our constitution. 
The author also points out various issues in the recent judgment. This is the crux of this editorial. See in yesterday's news analysis that is on 16th March 2022 we have discussed about hijab and the articles associated with it and key points of Karnataka High Court's judgment. So today we will see some important points highlighted by the author in this editorial. Before getting into the discussion I have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now let's start our discussion. See according to the preamble of our constitution the state that is the government must ensure or secure to all its citizens liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship and the government must also ensure equality of status and equality of opportunity and the government must promote among the citizens a sense of fraternity we know that fraternity means brotherhood or mutual support so the government must promote among the citizens a sense of fraternity while keeping in mind that the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation are protected according to dr b r ambedkar the three values of liberty equality and fraternity are a union of trinity if you even remove one of the values from the union of trinity then the very purpose of democracy is defeated See the important aim of our constitution is securing individual freedom right and for ensuring individual freedom the state must ensure these three principles that is the principle of liberty equality and fraternity are protected and given the due importance now what is the role of judiciary in relation to the individual rights and the union of trinity according to the framers of the constitution the independent courts must act as a guardians and help ensure that the principles of liberty equality and fraternity are protected from executive overreach the judiciary must act as a sentinels key wave what does sentinels key wave means it means a watchful guardian that is the judiciary must act as a watchful guardian so the role played by the judiciary is very important but recently according to the author of the editorial the judiciary has only enforced the popular morality that is the majoritarian views and while enforcing the majoritarian views the judiciary have not given importance to individual rights and freedom and this mentality of judiciary is reflected in the recent judgment by the karnataka high court in resham vs state of karnataka case Now this Karnataka High Court judgment is based on three conclusions. Now we will discuss about these conclusions. See, the first conclusion is that according to the court, the wearing of hijab is not essential to the practice of Islam. So the ban imposed on the use of hijab by students in classroom across the state of Karnataka does not infringe on the right of freedom of religion. Now the second conclusion is regarding qualified public space and derivative rights. According to the court there is no substantive right to free expression and privacy that can be claimed within the confines of a classroom. The classroom here being a qualified public space. Now the final conclusion is that the government's order is not aimed at discriminating against Muslim women. This is because the government's order does not by itself ban the use of hijab. And these are the three conclusions on which the Karnataka High Court judgment is based. Now according to the author of this editorial, the three conclusions on which the judgment is based has flaws in itself. Now let's see the flaws mentioned by the author one by one. First, take conclusion regarding essential religious practice. The court said that hijab is not an essential practice to the religion of Islam as petitioners failed to produce any evidence. See, according to the author, the essential religious practice test itself a pointless exercise. The Supreme Court has established a nearly unattainable standard to determine what constitutes an essential practice. See according to the Supreme Court something is an essential practice only if its absence or removal has the effect of destroying the religion itself and going by this logic except for a few fundamental practices no religious practice will actually survive the scrutiny of essential religious practice 
The next flaw pointed out by the author is that in most cases the doctrine of essential religious practice is used only where there is a conflict between individual rights and group rights. But this is not the issue in the Resham vs State of Karnataka case. Here the issue is that the exercise of free choice was curtailed by the state action. See article 25 of the constitution guarantees to all persons not only an equal right to profess practice and propagate religion but also a freedom of conscience. Now the petitioners argued in the court that they wore the hijab as a matter of conscience. But the court replied that there is no evidence in this case that the petitioners conscientiously believed in the necessity of the hijab. That is the students in their conscience did not believe in the necessity of the hijab and this is the next flaw according to the author see according to the author it is not the duty of the petitioners to produce evidences to prove that they are wearing hijab out of right conscience it is actually the duty of the state to produce evidence that the petitioners are wearing hijab without conscientiously believing in the necessity of the hijab the author also mentions that this whole issue could have been disposed of without entering the theological or religious domain according to article 25 freedom of conscience is subject to public order morality and health so instead of looking at the issue in a religious perspective if the court looked at it through a constitutional perspective and just evaluated if wearing of hijab affected public order morality and health the whole issue could have been disposed of easily now moving on to the next conclusion through which the judgment is arrived at that is substantive right do not apply in qualified public space according to the court the classroom is a qualified public space now the petitioners argued that by choosing to wear the hijab they were merely exercising their right to freedom of speech and privacy the court said that in classroom that is a qualified public space general discipline and decorum takes precedence over individual rights so in a qualified public space substantive rights transform into derived rights now i will give you a small homework please do find the difference between substantive right and procedural rights and post it in the comment section now coming back to the article in certain cases according to the court freedom of expression can be limited here the author of this editorial argues that to restrict freedom of expression the test of proportionality must be carried out and we know that the doctrine of proportionality evolved from the puttaswami judgment where the court said state action should not be more drastic than it ought to be for obtaining the desired result that is the state must take the least intrusive way to attain the desired result so according to the author muslim women could be provided with reasonable accommodation that is they could be allowed to wear the hijab in addition to the prescribed uniform but without any variation in color see the court said that uniforms are a symbol of equality and homogeneity so reasonable accommodation cannot be provided in this case but according to the author if the sole purpose of the uniform is to allow for no differences then every exhibition of faith in the classroom must be stamped out for instance religious and cultural marks on the forehead and accessories on other parts of the body have to be disallowed and this is not the case here there is a ban only on the wearing of hijab so the courts claim that government's order is not aimed at discriminating against muslim women is in fact false according to the author failure to provide for a reasonable accommodation for the hijab is a deliberate discrimination brought on muslim women so that's all regarding this editorial in this discussion we saw the importance of union of trinity for the proper functioning of the democracy and the role of the judiciary according to the framers of the constitution and the three conclusion based on which the recent judgment was arrived by the karnataka high court and we also saw various flaws in this conclusion brought out by the author of this editorial with these key learned points let's move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this news article talks about the centers own rank own pension that is orop scheme see on wednesday the supreme court upheld this own rank own pension scheme which is for the armed forces 
the issue for which a petition is filed in the supreme court is that the pensioners of the same rank are given varying pension amount but here the supreme court said that it is not a legal mandate that pensioners who hold the same rank must be given the same amount of pension and this is the crux of this new article given here in this context let's discuss about the on rank on pension scheme in a brief manner see we know that the orop scheme is for the armed forces see this scheme demonstrates india's commitment to the welfare of ex servicemen the government accepted this on rank on pension scheme after the constitution of 16th lok sabha this is done by issuing order on 7th of november 2015 an armed force personnel retired up to 30th june 2014 were covered under this order and note that an allocation of rupees 1000 crore was provided for this scheme in the 2014-15 budget See, one rank on pension implies that uniform pension should be paid to the armed force personnel retiring in the same rank. Here, you have to note that this is with the same length of service regardless of their date of retirement. So, ORP implies bridging the gap between the rate of pension of current pensioners and the past pensioners at periodic intervals. See before the implementation of on rank on pension the computation of pension was linked to the pay drawn by the personnel in a particular pay scale or pay band at the time of retirement we know that the pay scales are revised to a higher side generally on the recommendation of pay commissions for example a personnel retiring after the revision of the pay scales gets more pension than who had already retired Thus the on rank on pension scheme bridges the gap in the pension of the past and present retirees. Now let's see some of the salient features of on rank on pension order. Firstly, the pension of past pensioners would be refixed and this will be done on the basis of pension of retirees of the calendar year 2013 and this benefit will be effective from 1st of July 2014. and secondly the pension will be refixed for all pensioners and this is done on the basis of the average of minimum and maximum pension of personnel retired in 2013 that too in the same rank and with the same length of service and the next significant feature is that the arrears will be paid in four equal half yearly installments however all the family pensioners including those in receipt of special liberalized family pension and gallantry award winners shall be paid arrears in one installment and another significant feature is that the pension would be refixed every 5 years now let's see who are all benefited and who are all not benefited from this orop scheme see this orop scheme benefits defense force pensioners retired up to 30th of june 2014 and note that those personnel who opt to get discharged on their own request will not be entitled for the benefits of this on rank on pension scheme and that's all regarding this news article so far we have discussed about on rank on pension scheme which is for the armed forces The armed force personnel retired up to 30th of June 2014 were covered under this scheme. It states that the uniform pension should be paid to the armed force personnel retiring in the same rank. An ORP implies bridging the gap between the rate of pension of current pensioners and the past pensioners at periodic intervals. And we have seen some of the significant features of this scheme. The first feature is that the pension of past pensioners would be refixed and this will be done on the basis of pension of retirees of the calendar year 2013 and the pension will be refixed for all pensioners this will be done on the basis of average of minimum and maximum pension of personnel retired in 2013 and we have also seen that the arrears will be paid in four equal half yearly installment and the pension would be refixed every 5 years and that's all regarding this news article now we will move on to next news article discussion look at this news article the article mentions that a low pressure region in bay of bengal is likely to intensify into a cyclonic storm in the coming days this weather event is likely to bring isolated showers in the state of kerala in this context let's revise the basics about tropical cyclones see Tropical cyclones are violent storms that originate over oceans in tropical areas. 
these cyclones move over to the coastal areas bringing about large scale destruction caused by violent winds very heavy rainfall and storm surges we know that tropical cyclones are one of the most devastating natural calamities and they are known by different names in different areas for example they are called cyclones in the indian ocean hurricanes in the atlantic typhoons in the western pacific and south china sea and it is called willy willies in the western australia now let's see about the conditions favorable for the formation and intensification of tropical storms see these conditions are extremely important any one of these conditions can be asked as a statement in the preliminary examination so please remember these conditions see there are five conditions firstly there should be a large surface area with a temperature higher than 27 degree celsius and secondly there should be a presence of coriolis force and thirdly there should be some variations in the vertical wind speed and there should be a pre existing weak low pressure area or low level cyclonic circulation and finally there should be an upper divergence above the sea level system when these conditions are satisfied the tropical storms emerge now having seen the favorable condition let us see where the energy for the tropical cyclone comes from see the energy that intensifies the storm comes from the release of the latent heat from the condensation process this condensation process occurs in the cumulonimbus clouds surrounding the center of the storm and with continuous supply of moisture from the sea the storm is further strengthened and on reaching the land the moisture supply is cut off and the storm dissipates and the place where the tropical cyclone crosses the coast is called the landfall of the cyclone see a mature tropical cyclone is characterized by the strong spirally circulating wind around the center called the eye the diameter of this circulating system can vary between 150 km and 250 km we know that the eye is a region of calm with subsiding air and around the eyes there is an eye wall where there is a strong spiraling ascent of air to greater height reaching the tropopus and the wind reaches maximum velocity in this region reaching as high as 250 km per hour see the torrential rain occurs here from the eye wall rain bands may radiate and rows and rows of cumulonimbus and cumulus clouds may drift into the outer region the diameter of the storm over the bay of bengal arabian sea and indian ocean is between 600 to 1200 km This system moves slowly about 300 to 500 km per hour. These are some important points regarding the tropical cyclones. Now let's do a quick recap. See, tropical cyclones are the violent storms that originate over oceans in the tropical areas. And we have seen five favorable conditions for the formation and intensification of tropical cyclones. One, there should be a large sea surface with temperature higher than 27 degrees Celsius. and there should be a presence of coriolis force and there should be a small variation in the vertical wind speed now the fourth condition is that there should be a pre existing weak low pressure area or low level cyclonic circulation and finally there should be a upper divergence above the sea level system and that's all regarding this news article now we will move on to next part of our news article discussion which is nothing but our preliminary practice questions discussion now look at the first question Consider the following statements. No development zone is earmarked in all categories of coastal regulation zones except CRZ 1. Statement 2, NDZ is not applicable in the areas falling within notified port limits. And which of the following statements are correct? A 1 only, B 2 only, C both 1 and 2 and D neither 1 nor 2. See here the statement 1 is incorrect. because the no development zone is here marked only in coastal regulation zone 3 and we have already discussed that for coastal regulation zone 3a area up to 50 meters from the high tide line on the landward side is called no development zone whereas the same is 200 meters for coastal regulation zone 3b now regarding the second statement it is correct and this is as per the coastal regulation zone 2019 amendments So here our correct answer is option B two only. Now look at the second question. Consider the following pairs: Cyclone Yas, Arabian Sea; Cyclone Gati, Bay of Bengal; 
and cyclone jawad bay of bengal and which of the following pairs are incorrectly matched a 1 and 2 only b 2 and 3 only option c 1 and 3 only and option d all the above see here the pair 1 is wrong because cyclone yas is formed in the bay of bengal in may 2021 it made landfall in odisha causing damages and it also caused damage in west bengal and regarding the pair 2 it is also wrong the cyclone gati formed from the area of low pressure in the arabian sea on 21st november it was the strongest tropical cyclone on record to make the landfall in somalia and regarding the pair 3 it is correct because cyclone jawad formed in the bay of bengal in december 2021 it was a weak tropical cyclone that caused major disruptions over andhra pradesh odisha and west bengal in india while bringing heavy rainfall and strong winds over the states as a weakened system so here our answer is option a 1 and 2 only now look at the third question it is regarding on rank on pension consider the following statements with reference to orop scheme statement 1 it is a central scheme for armed forces and statement 2 pension given under this scheme will be refixed every 10 years see again this is a very easy question find the answer and post it in the comment section the main question are displayed here write your answer and post the answer in the comment section if you like the video hit the like button post your comments and share the video with your friends and don't forget to subscribe shankar ias academy youtube channel thanks for watching <laughs>